The 16-bit game era was a giant leap in colour and sound for the home gamer. But it was also a very frustrating time if you're a kid and you were trying to program your own games. You couldn't really just go out and buy a dev kit for one of these. Now of course you can do that now and just get flashcards, but it's still quite hard to program for these machines and you end up having to program in assembler to get it running fast enough. So what if somebody made a little box that was easy to code but had outputs similar to these 16-bit boxes? Maybe something about this size that you could plug a keyboard into? Maybe even a screen? Well, we're going to talk about that today, but to begin with, let's get some perspective. Before the mid-1970s, it was almost unthinkable to have your own computer for programming games. But by the 70s, the price of digital logic, specifically memory, had dropped to the point where an enthusiast could now build a computer at home. Most designs were published in magazines or available as kits, like the famous Altair 8800. Out of the box, the Altair was initially programmed by manually switching each byte of machine code into memory. Now, to make life easier, the obvious expansion was a keyboard and a screen known as a terminal. But for beginners, programming was still really complicated. So a language which had long been around called BASIC provided a very simple platform that inspired a whole generation of programmers. Once computers started moving into the home, BASIC proved so popular that many computers simply booted into BASIC when you turned them on. Take this VIC-20, we turn the power on, and we're straight into BASIC where we can start coding instantly. But BASIC had its limits. Compared to professional games, BASIC graphics ran really slow. And it was often this graphic speed which meant a lot of people, including myself, eventually gave up on BASIC. And that got me thinking, because the Amiga in its later life had Blitz Basic and Blitz Basic 2, for which there were several commercial games released, because it had those fast graphics routines. So surely, if somebody took that same approach with a modern system on chip, maybe the dream of a cheap boot to basic kit computer with accelerated graphics could be a reality. And it turned out that this existed in the form of the Color Maximite, a build-it-yourself kit which booted straight into BASIC like the old machines. But unfortunately, it was limited to eight colors. My wish was for something that could graphically match that of, say, a Super Nintendo or a Mega Drive. And this is where the Color Maximite 2 comes into play. It was announced about a week ago, and from the spec that's on paper, it looks incredible. It looks like exactly what I would love to have in a BASIC box. But there's only one way to find out, and that is to build one. And at the moment, it's uh, not available in kit form, so I was able to get prototype plans from the designer, and uh, I thought we would have a go at building one. Now, I'm pretty old school in the fact I still etch my boards, and this one has 300 holes in it, so I'm not gonna be there like manually trying to drill out 300 precision holes. It's not gonna happen, so we need to fabricate the board, and that's where we're gonna start. So. Let's check out what we need to do to build a Maximite 2. The computer requires three elements. A DIY motherboard, which handles all the input and output duties. A wave share, which is a board containing a CPU and memory. And a copy of the Maximite firmware. Now luckily, I was able to get the PCB Gerber files, which together combine to create all the steps of making a PCB, including a white overlay which shows where the components go. The minimum order for this particular size of PCB was 5 units. By the time I added shipping that was quicker than 30 days, things did get a little bit pricier. But uploading the board files was easy and it was apparently checked and approved straight away. And they certainly took my money straight away anyway. Now components wise, most electronics enthusiasts have boxes full of parts or little drawers with all bits in them. And um, I'm an audio person so I've got a lot of stuff to build things like uh, preamps and equalizers and MIDI projects and maybe something like uh, an Amiga sampler. Spoiler alert on that one. So I've got the switch, a bunch of LEDs, one of the cap values and a few of the resistor values. Sourcing the rest of the parts from a recommended supplier was quite easy with the exception of a connector that I thought was a bit expensive and I might add later. But the main issue I hit was the minimum quantity issue. You see, when you buy something in kit form, you get the exact parts you need in perfect quantities. For instance, the Gigatron kit, which is another kit computer, comes with your PCB, your chips, your components, your pre-flashed firmware, and a nice little box to put everything in. 
In sourcing parts for the Maximite, these were the items that were available individually, and these were the items that required a minimum order of five. Now I know I could have sourced a lot of these parts from a more hobbyist level place, and I did look into doing that. There was two problems. The first was uh, the free postage, because you don't qualify for free postage, certainly in Australia, when you're buying uh, maybe just one or two parts of something. And there was no one small hobbyist place that had all of the parts. And the flip side was also that uh, a lot of the parts I was looking at were very different to the bits that came in the official specifications. So because of that I would have had to do things like bodge wires onto surface mounts and it just would have got messy. So I've ordered the parts for five. I just quickly put the message out and said hey does anyone else want to build a Maximite and I instantly got three replies within an hour. So I guess we sit back with our cup of tea and we wait for stuff to arrive. Oh how good is tea? All right, so the PCBs have arrived and I'm hoping that these are all good. Um, fingers crossed, ooh, it's vacuum packed. Hey, look at that. I did blackboards with uh, white text on and they've actually come up looking pretty good. All the through holes are there. All right, let's try one of these. This will be the main thing. Oh yeah, easy. And we'll just try a resistor in the hole as well. Yeah, we're good. And, uh, well, that's really a board ready to go. Dun, 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 dun. The parts have arrived. And then uh, the next day, this one arrived uh, from China. Then this one arrived from Vietnam. Then this one arrived from Mexico. The fact it's free postage and it's come in from five different countries. I don't know how they do it, but let's, I guess, see if it's all there. And this was the first bag. So it's a baggie and a baggie. Inside another baggie. Inside another baggie. And that's a bag of USB connectors, and that's all that came in that one, so... I have to admit I was getting a little worried when the biggest package contained just five capacitors. But then I hit the jackpot. Whoa, all right, so this is a little bit better. And this one has a very crazy looking package strip. I'm gonna see if it works, you ready? Oh, <laughs> no it didn't. Oh, close enough. Wow, look at these. Just baggies galore. Woo. Okay, well this is definitely the rest of the stuff. And what an amazingly global effort this is. I mean, there's parts from Indonesia, Malaysia, China, Thailand, USA, Israel, Mexico, Japan, Taiwan. Sadly, nothing from Australia, but hey, it's being assembled in Australia. So we'll, we'll put that on the list. I chose to solder the CPU mount sockets first. There was 160 pins, and then I did the SD card slot. You can see up here we've got our VGA connector marked, and all of this hardware here is a bunch of resistors, which when built is going to form our video DAC. Now the VGA connector might seem like an old connector, but it's something of a standard for retro computers, and in fact a lot of old monitors will support it as well. As far as building the DAC, you can see that it's just a bunch of digital lines that get dropped down to a lower voltage. And if we take, for instance, the least significant bit, that one is fed through more resistors, so it becomes a darker element of the picture. And when you add all of those progressively brighter elements together, they form white. Or in this case, we've got a color DAC, so we have three of these for red, green and blue. Now the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that one of the colour channels is 6-bit instead of 5-bit. So why is this? Well, if you look at an image and we look at it, for instance, with even bits, so 5 bits of red, green and blue, you'll notice on the gradient, if we just enhance the image a bit, that the difference between having 5 bits of green and 6 bits of green makes a huge difference to the quality of the image. The downside to having one of your channels with more bits is if you try to do a grayscale, you'll notice that it steps into color as you go through the gradients. But I digress because our DAC is built and we have a VGA output. Soldering the rest of the board was quite easy. The only issue I had was the black boards, which made it a bit hard to see if your solder was sitting correctly. But I guess that's why they usually have green boards. You know, you live and learn. So now I'm almost ready to turn the power on, except first we've got to flash the firmware onto the Waveshare board. 
And here's the finished board, and you can see we've plugged in the CPU. And what we're going to do now is connect it via USB and actually look at Windows Device Manager just to see if a new COM port pops up. And it looks like it's refreshed. There it is, COM5. And we'll browse for our firmware. And there it is. And we're just going to make sure we verify it. And we'll start programming. In total, it probably took about a minute to flash. And I've got a verification. And that meant I should technically be able to power it up. And our VGA connector, just in the back here. No matter what happens next, I'm going to put this in the video. Um, so we're just going to plug into, I'm just using a power bank to power it. Um, 91%. All right, let's go and plug it in. And fingers crossed, we'll get an image. God, I really hope this works. Oh, hey, and we're in. All right, so US keyboard, roughly the 16th, I think, of the, does anybody know what date it is these days? <laughs> no idea, a bit of a click, and we're in. So we can edit new file. I'm so excited. The first thing I coded might look a little bit simple, but I was really just testing the video output and seeing what the video modes were. From that point, I really needed to test the speed of how quick the graphics routines were so I could understand what the unit could do. This was my benchmarking program, and it allowed me to see which of the graphics modes were quicker. At this point, I realized I hadn't tested the sound either, so... Couldn't resist it. All right, let's do something a bit more uh, creative. Firstly, I grabbed a bunch of simple sprites, so thanks for Arborus for those, and went about loading them into BASIC. All right, this was my first attempt at a game, and I wanted to make something that would fit in a single loop that you could look at. So let's run it and see what we get. Oh, music, of course. So while this mightn't seem like much for modern standards, there was a few things that made this really impressive for me. Firstly, everything was moving super smoothly. It was simple to do old school looking acceleration and deacceleration on the movements and sprite swapping depending on the direction I was traveling. But the best bit was I was able to program all of the 2D engine logic within about an hour. <laughs> So I wanted to make a graphics introduction to a game, you know. Uh, there is also some code later on that is ported from an older version of BASIC. It took me about 15, 20 minutes to port this across and change some of the uh, syntax. Certainly the draw commands and things were a bit different. Uh, but I'll let this run and uh, point out a few things as we go. Apart from the uh, raster scan stuff at the top, you can see here that we've got uh, multiple layers of parallax, giant sprites that change as well. Flip the other way. So we're really lucky that we can do this kind of scrolling and get away with it. Got a scene change, seamless, no artifacts when it changes over. This page scroll just goes on for ages, three pages worth of video RAM. This is using flip, flipping effects to get that uh, flickering look on the engine. And of course, got to do some visual transition effects. Mega Space Mission 2020. <laughs> and I wanted to check that it did the proper aliasing on the audio, and so it's good to hear that. You can see with our memory here, we've got a ton of free memory. I've only used 15% of my graphics memory. And talking of graphics, a massive thanks to the Disaster Area for giving me the overhead renders of the ship. And finally, I've put together a Mandelbrot fractal, uh, and this is really inefficient code, but we'll run it anyway. The first bit will go quickly, and then it'll slow down. Um, and it's not optimised in any way, but it's still actually not running too badly. I mean, I've seen slower fractals than this. The good thing about being in 256 colour mode is, of course, this. And you can see we're rotating the colours because we can just rotate through the palette and it'll instantly change on the screen. And this is great because if you want to do day or night effects, you can just change the palette uh, and you can change the colour within a level design or something like that and have all your colours change, do fade ins and fade outs and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, the music as well is pretty pumping. I've got this running through my big speakers and it sounds really, really clean. 
So there we go. That's my final little bit of number crunching in the programming challenge. And to show you a couple of quick other tech demos, this is an adaption of Gauntlet by Mario Xavier. And you can hear the music and the sound effects are bang on, and it's also scrolling at 72 frames a second. And Mario has also been experimenting with Final Fight and porting a bunch of the graphics across, and you can see it's handling it just fine. So if this is what can be done in the first few weeks with some beta versions of the unit, I'm really excited to see what people will come up with. This is probably a good time to show you the file browser. You can jump into any uh, program instantly from here and load it. Uh, you can also open and look at any of your graphics files. And a good thing as well is you can listen to sound effects. My case is a little bit rough, but it's functional and it's got a nice little power switch on the front and a few little uh, custom touches too. The big question is, was building this box worth the effort? Well, when you power this unit up, there's a certain magic that happens. And I think it's because you instantly get dropped back into that land of code and you can pick back up where you left off within seconds. For collaboration with other artists, it reads modern graphics and sound files, it also supports old formats like the Amiga mod format and the sprite files. And something that we haven't even mentioned is the amount of sensors it can read. It can read temperature and acceleration and knobs and game pads. It's got a Nintendo Wii nunchuck connector on the front. You can also trigger servo motors, lights or relays. And you can auto boot so you can run it like an arcade. So the plans are out there if you want to build any of the Maximites, including the Micromites. Uh, they're all free to program as well. The uh, basic is a free language. You can even come up with your own design if you wanted to. Uh, and Silicon Chip Magazine is doing a two-part special for the next couple of months, uh, which will be exciting. And they're going to be talking about uh, the more in-depth design of how these things work. And I think going into more the sensor stuff and, and all of that, I've gone down the graphics and just programming hole, but that's only one part of this. You know, I can only imagine what else you could add to this. Uh, and in a way, that kind of brings it back to what we were looking at at the start when we looked at the Altair. Uh, and the kit form and the opportunities that it gave people to explore. Um, and this carries on that legacy in a really beautiful way. So thank you very much to the creators uh, and everyone who's worked super hard on this. I really appreciate it. And having lost three days to this thing till like two in the morning, three in the morning, five in the morning, <laughs> just going down the rabbit hole, this thing is, is great. So there you have it. Just as the world thought they'd never see another basic booting box in their lifetime, certainly not one with 16-bit graphics, we finally got one for 2020.